with powerful shearing jaws and armoured faces that really stand out amongst other fish both of the time they were around and today. Placoderms are some of the Paleozoic's most iconic animals, and for good reason. Doncleosteus is the most well-known and largest of the group, though there were a good number of other animals that also deserve more of a spotlight. One of these animals is the very bizarre alien Acanthus, their name meaning alien spine, with them being animals that have recently undergone quite the drastic change in terms of how we perceive their appearance. First described in 1957 from remains found in Poland, and with more later being described from Morocco, they lived during the late Devonian period, where these localities were all submerged coastlines and regions where animals like alien Acanthus could thrive. Many of the fossils, however, were quite fragmentary and offered a very limited detail on what they would have looked like in life. What gave alien Acanthus their name was from what was judged at the time to be some kind of elongated spines near their fins, though, as we'll discuss, was quite the shaky judgement. Over the past two decades, further research has turned up more well-preserved fossils of the fish, where, with an analysis done by Dr. Molina Jobbins and colleagues who worked with researchers from several museums, the true appearance of alien acanthus was unravels, and they were even more unusual looking than was first thought. The key fossil that ended up being the biggest giveaway that early assumptions of the animal were flawed came from a nearly complete skull, close to a metre long from Morocco, which, with it being articulated, revealed that the long spines of the fish weren't spines at all, but weirdly enough, were actually part of their lower jawbones. This gave them an elongated lower jaw that was over twice the length of the rest of their skull, giving them an extreme underbite. This morphology is quite absurd looking, and well, it is, I mean, it is rather ridiculous looking, but it is interestingly enough, not an unprecedented look. This extreme case of prognathism, the misalignment of the two jaws, has also been seen in other animals like Ornithoprion in the Carboniferous, the living halfbeaks, as well as the Pliocene porpoise Semirostrum. Though out of all of them, Aeliodacanthus is both not only the oldest example of this anatomy, but also the most extreme. Out of the three previous animals mentioned, halfbeaks have the longest lower jaw proportionally, though even then, Aeliodacanthus has one which is 20% longer than theirs, which is quite considerable. In terms of what their long lower jaw may have been used for, it is worth looking at living halfbeaks, of which the ability to assess them is of course a lot easier given we can observe their behaviours today and how they use their jaw. It is worth noting that in halfbeaks, they don't thrash their long chin around like how sailfish and marlin do to slice up their food, and instead appear to facilitate a more sensory function. In a paper published in 1985 by Montgomery and Sanders in 1985, they show that there are a series of lateral line pores along the length of their lower jaws, as well as alongside small neuromass within said pores, which help to receive stimuli for movements in their environment. This makes sense as a function for the long lower jaw, given it is quite a frail and ungainly structure, and so, instead of being used for slicing up prey, it is instead used to seek them out. The species assessed in the study feed at night on zooplankton, and in doing so, under total darkness, were still able to find their prey hunting for and eating them without having to use their eyes. Interestingly enough, when it comes to alien acanthus, the nathal plates that comprise their jaw have sharp and posteriorly recurved teeth on them that continue down its length, which is a condition not at all seen in halfbeaks, where, with them, their chin was just extended, whereas in alien acanthus, the whole jaw received a length increase over an evolutionary timescale. This along with the fact that their long lower jaw does not show any presence of specialised nerve canals for sensory purposes, means that alien acanthus may instead have used their lower jaw more so like billfish, though being more of an upside-down version, wielding it to stun or injure targets, and perhaps even being used, as suggested in the recent paper, to some kind of trap, whereby they could invite prey in and then trap them given their prey would have only one way to go once in, and that would be further into the mouth due to the presence of the recurved teeth on their lower jaw. With their upper jaw then being able to independently move, as was found in the study, they could then snap shut once the prey item was in too deep. The jaw could well have also helped in them sifting through sediments, which is seen in halfbeaks today, though as with all of these examples, they remain speculative. Whatever the case, alien acanthus represents one of the last placoderms in terms of their evolutionary diversity, and play a very important role in understanding the animal diversity of the time and how these animals today relate to living ones, giving us a great record on how fish and wider vertebrates came to be as wide-ranging and as variable as they are in their body plans. All in all, I thank you for watching this video on these animals, and that you may have learned something new. If you would like to see more from this channel, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And with that, I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.